Uh, hello, uh, welcome uh, everybody to a new session of the Nomadic Labs Caravanserai Seminar. It's our pleasure to have uh, Casey with us today. So for, for those of you who don't know him, uh, Casey is uh, a associate or assistant professor at the I, I, IT Institute in Madras, India. He's also um, part of Caribes now. Uh, he's been in the Camel ecosystem for a long time. Uh, today, he's going to give us a very exclusive preview of uh, his uh, recent uh, work uh, that's going to be presented at PLDI this year. It's a joint work with uh, his group, uh, with Bimalas, uh, Ardash, and Kartik. Uh, some of them are here. And as usual, feel free to interrupt and make questions or post them on the chat, and I will sort of give you the floor. So, Casey, again, thank you for joining us, and uh, the, show is, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So, <clears throat> Uh, before I begin, so this is um, this is fresh uh, part of the process. So I just made the slides today. So some of them I may have too many slides. Feel free to interrupt the question. Okay. Um, so this is uh, joint work with my student Vimala uh, Adir and uh, my colleague at IIT Madras uh, Karthik. Um, okay. So what's the setting here? So if you look at uh, modern uh, web services today, uh, like Amazon. Netflix, YouTube, and whatnot, they're all distributed systems, right? And uh, they, they replicate their services across uh, um, multiple continents with the idea that um, you want to reduce uh, latency that is perceived by the user, but also handle faults. So if uh, one of these servers uh, goes down, uh, the entire service is not taken away, right? So you want an always on service, and this is what they do. And uh, typically, these servers are also connected over uh, the public internet. But uh, when um, we as programmers or users access the service, um, we don't uh, usually think about uh, this complex uh, layering of uh, multiple servers connected across the internet. We sort of say, hey, I'm connecting to my bank and I expect my bank uh, website to work. Um, so we sort of have this uh, implicit image of uh, um, that uh, even though it might be distributed, there is a, there is a notion of the centralized server and implicitly, you might uh, expect some guarantees uh, from this uh, uh, assumption of a centralized server, uh, which, of course, is not true. Um, this, uh, this often breaks down at the edges. Most of the time it works, but it does uh, break down at the edges. And it's a particular challenge for uh, um, developers, right, who have to particularly take care of uh, these edge cases. And in particular, if you are uh, programming against this um, um, against the centralized uh, view of the world, you would expect uh, um, guarantees that you would uh, typically associate it with uh, databases such as serializability or uh, concurrent uh, data structures that operate on the uh, same machines with the linearizability. But the reality is that uh, these systems are running with uh, weaker guarantees, weak consistency and weak isolation because they are balancing this uh, notion of availability and, uh, and, and being provide, uh, providing some sort of consistency. So it does leak towards the edges. And the, and the difficulty is that because the programmers are, uh, um, as a programmer, you're dealing with these edge cases all the time, even simple data structures become uh, complicated. They attract a lot of complexity when things are made distributed. My friend Lindsay had this uh, nice tweet uh, um, a few years ago where she said, hey, you want to instrument a counter, good luck with that. Right? Of course, uh, instrument counters is what uh, uh, many PhDs have been written about. Um, so why don't we instrument a counter in a distributed setting? <clears throat> Let's start with the sequential counter. And the counter that I'm going to sort of model is, uh, is written in an odd way, um, just because it uh, makes it uh, nicer to be distributed. So the counter, um, um, API, the signature and the, uh, and the implementation is given in OCaml style. So you have a counter data type where you can read, add, and subtract. And uh, each of these operations um, return a new value of the counter. So essentially, I'm sort of uh, um, imagining a functional version of a counter where uh, if you add a value to a counter, you get a new counter. Uh, if you read, you just get the value, right? Uh, this is fairly obvious. So you sort of... Uh, just to just state the obvious, when you add uh, a value x, 
to the um, counter, you just get x plus two. And similarly, the counter value is uh, uh, x here, so you get x minus two, which is the new value of the counter. Right? So <clears throat> this is written in idiomatic style. We all uh, um, sort of uh, love this uh, nice, purely functional way of writing things. The thing that works nicely here is uh, you can take this counter and uh, you can sort of compose uh, larger data structures with uh, this counter. In particular, in OCaml, you can just say, I just want to have a list of counters. Hey, uh, I have a um, alpha list. I can just make a counter list now, right? So this is what we do all the time. But uh, when we sort of uh, deal with uh, distributed systems, uh, things get complicated, right? So imagine the setting where uh, I have multiple replicas that is spread across the world and I want to create a counter. Um, so I instantiate a counter with the initial value zero. This counter gets replicated uh, across the world eventually, right? So it doesn't happen instantaneously. Um, eventually it uh, gets replicated. And then somebody uh, uh, connects to the North American replica and then say instrument two. And concurrently, um, before this update has propagated, somebody at uh, Japan says instrument three. So these increments are accepted and uh, the uh, response goes back to the client. So essentially you don't want to um, pay the cost of synchronizing across uh, the globe because it is, it is expensive uh, on, uh, on good days and impossible on bad days because uh, um, things may get disconnected uh, um, at any point in time, right? So network particles are always uh, uh, there. So how do you reconcile these changes? Uh, the idea is that uh, you could just take these local operations and apply it to the replica. So all the replicas eventually get to play. So this works, right? So counter, hey, maybe, maybe this works. So may, let's, let's make it more interesting. So let's add multiplication um, to our counter. I just want to multiply my counter value with a given integer to get a new value of the counter. Um, and it's implemented in the obvious way. Let's say my initially my counter value is seven. Um, on uh, one replica, I increment uh, the value by one, I get eight. On the other replica, I increment, I multiply uh, the counter by three, so I get 21. Um, our earlier idea, which is to take the local operations and directly apply uh, to all of the replicas, right? So let's try doing that and uh, let's see what happens. So if you multiply, if you take this multiply by three and apply it to uh, the other replica, you get eight times three, that is 24. And uh, you get uh, 21 plus one, the operation there, and you get 22. So these replicas uh, diverge, right? So this is um, um, this is not what we want uh, our database state to be. Eventually, we want all of the database state to converge to the same value. And if you naively take your local operations and then apply it to um, different replicas, uh, which may be in different states, then your replicas will diverge. I mean, the observation is that multiplication and addition don't commute. Right? And the fix for this problem is that uh, you sort of capture the effect of multiplication through a commutative operation, which is addition. So addition commutes with addition. So let's uh, let's capture the effect of multiplication using addition. So if you do that, uh, then uh, the left branch stays the same. The right branch, uh, um, when you multiply by three, the effect of uh, multiplying uh, seven by three is uh, increment the value of the counter by 14. So you transmit the increment operation to the left branch and increment one on the right branch. Now uh, the replica converts. So this is what uh, <coughs> the state that we expect because that is the intention. And uh, that is where we are. Even though it looks very simple, this is the idea behind the CRDTs, right? Uh, what are CRDTs? CRDTs are converged and replicated data types. They've been around for more than a decade now. There has been lots and lots of research into CRDTs. <clears throat> and um, what CRDTs guarantee you is what is known as uh, strong eventual consistency, which is that uh, these CRDTs, which are essentially different replicas, may accept operations locally, but eventually these operations will be transmitted to all of the replicas and all the replicas will converge to the same state. Right? So it's eventual convergence, but it's strong because they all converge to the same state. And there have been lots and lots of CRDTs that have been uh, um, uh, implemented. So there is row only counters, positive negative counters, or such graphs, and uh, more complicated ones, uh, including JSON. <clears throat> 
CRDTs typically give you a very simple interface to the client. So um, they they are they are um, they can be as rich as uh, typical data types, right? But um, because they are uh, they are um, uh, the complexity of reasoning with CRDTs in a distributed setting is difficult. Um, these operations tend to be fairly simple. But fundamentally, the problem with CRDTs that uh, um, we find is that uh, when you design a CRDT, you are essentially designing a new data type from scratch, right? So you you have to sort of think about, hey, I have I have my data type. This is the state that I want to represent. Then I have these operations. I need to decide how to make these operations commute, right? And oftentimes, what happens is that uh, um, they start off being very simple, and then uh, their implementation. Once you start start uh, thinking about these various guarantees, they do not mirror your sequential counterparts. And uh, the typical way you reason about the sequential data types um, is uh, it's just thrown out the window. You have to sort of re-engineer uh, these data types from scratch. They look very different. So both the implementation overhead and the proof burden falls on you. Right? Um, these are these are indeed quite tricky. And the other problem that I that we find in this work is that uh, typically CRDTs are presented as one-off. So you have a G counter, you have a PN counter. Hey, you have a G counter and a PN counter. But you can't take these uh, um, data types, and then the thing that we do in functional programming all the time is composition, right? Or not even functional programming. You have generics. You just want to say, "Hey, I have a set, I have a counter. I just want a, a set of counters." So these CRTTs don't compose because uh, their individual operations will come back to uh, more examples of uh, composition. But typically, they are not written with composition in mind, which which just means that if you want to implement your own application. You have to implement a if if uh, if the library of CRDTs fit your bill, hey, you're you're all set. But if it doesn't, then you're stuck, right? You have to write your own CRDTs from scratch, and uh, and that's uh, and that's a lot of work. <clears throat> so the question that we wanted to ask um, this was a few years ago is, uh, hey, can we program and reason about replicated data types just as an extension of sequential counterparts? And uh, this is where the idea of uh, mergeable replicated data types comes in. Right? And uh, what do these mergeable replicated data types uh, give you or sequential data types? So we have this notion of uh, a three-way merge function. Um, a three-way merge function uh, assumes that uh, whenever you have uh, two replicas that you want to merge, so you would, uh, you would have the two versions, the state of the two versions, and the lowest common ancestor at which these versions branched off, right? And uh, this merge function tells you, using this contextual information in the two versions, what is the result of the merge, right? So that is what we expect from um, the implementer of the data type to provide. So this merge function comes from, um, I mean, you can see where the inspiration comes from. So it comes from Git, right? So Git uses three-way merges all the time. So this is sort of asking this question of, uh, hey, we have Git. Um, use this three-way merge for uh, uh, files, merging files. What if we extend that to arbitrary data types, right? Can we actually build uh, um, nicer versions of distributed data types? So that is what we wanted to ask. It turns out that it, uh, it, um, uh, it's sufficient for a lot of cases. For example, here is a counter uh, merge. So what we do in the counter merge is uh, um, the implementation says, hey, if you want to merge to counters, Take the lowest common ancestor, which is the counter value before uh, these uh, versions branched off. Compute the deltas, right? So V1 uh, uh, is uh, sort of uh, the delta between V1 minus LCA is the delta between the current version of the LCA. And similarly, get the delta to V2. And if you sum them all up, you get the result. Right? This works very well in practice. So, uh, so the same examples, we have 7, 8, 21. Now we don't care about the individual operations, we just care about the state. And uh, we get 22 on both sides because uh, because for these two operations, eight and 21, um, the lowest common ancestor is seven, eight, seven, and the delta is one here and the delta is 14 there. So you sum them all up, you get 22. Right? This is the same as what we had got uh, with this uh, operation-based thing where we kind of transmitted the effect of the multiplication over, right? Sort of doing the same thing, um, and 
and this three-way merge function makes the counter suitable for distribution. Um, so the runtime model that we are assuming, which I won't go into much detail in this work, is uh, we are assuming Erman, right? Um, we have Erman, which gives you this uh, nice uh, uh, layer on top of which you can write these merging deprecated data types. Um, that's there. We are assuming that uh, that runtime exists. So the other thing that I mentioned is that we don't appeal to individual operations. We can independently extend the data type with additional operations as long as the merge function provides uh, reasonable semantics. Okay, so <clears throat> the thing that uh, we have uh, now made is we've lifted the level of abstraction over CRDTs. Typically, CRDTs are expressed over uh, low-level concerns such as uh, um, message passing uh, between multiple replicas. So you have to deal with things like message loss, de duplication, deordering, and things like that. CRDTs essentially, sorry, MRDTs essentially lift, lift the level of abstraction up by asking the programmer to write three-way merges. Um, of course, I mean, um, we sort of uh, assume that there is a middleware that takes care of uh, all of these concerns for us. But essentially, we are we are aiming for better programmability of this part. Um, for example, take our earlier example. Um, we get 22 on both sides when you merge. What happens if you merge again? Uh, say we just pick uh, branch 21, right? The state at 21 and then merge it with uh, uh, the left branch. So we just apply the same rules. The lowest common ancestor between these two versions is 21, right? And the two versions are 21 and 22. So lowest common ancestor is 21. And the delta on the right-hand side is zero, the left-hand side is one, so you get 22 again. So even if you happen to merge again, which is sort of like the analog of uh, duplication, you get the same, result, right? So these uh, these nice properties um, uh, of, uh, say, item potents still uh, are very so we are sort of taking away this uh, um, systems level concerns and lifting it up, right? So this is quite nice. <clears throat> and then what we asked a few years ago is, uh, does this idea actually generalize? Uh, it does sort of. Um, so why do I say sort of? Uh, uh, I have this uh, in CRDPs, there's a typically uh, observed that removes set which the idea is that you have a set data type and uh, in a set where you can add and remove, if you have to deal with uh, concurrent operations, you have to pick a, pick a winner between concurrent adds and remove from the same element. And observe remove set says that if you have a concurrent add and a concurrent remove of the same element, the add wins. It is as if the remove did not see this uh, concurrent add. So it would have only removed the existing elements if there were any. So this ad survives, right? That's the idea there. Um, and, uh, and 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 set CRDT is well studied. So we sort of um, uh, said, okay, so overset is a nice semantics. So let's just take uh, the uh, um, three-way merge semantics for set, right? Which was proposed by Gautam Kaki um, uh, and me and other uh, collaborators from Purdue when I was at Purdue. Um, so we said, hey, here is a version of uh, um, um, replicated set, right? Where the idea is that uh, just like counters, right? We want to capture the notion in uh, a three-way merge. So we say, hey, given an LCA version one, version two, what is the notion of a merge set? And uh, the idea uh, is that uh, you take all the unmodified elements in the three versions between LCA v1 and v2, um, so any element that has been removed uh, is not included, right? So it, it only includes the elements that have not changed. And also add the elements that were added in either of the versions, V1 and V2, right? So this was the idea there. It seemed okay on paper, right? It gives you some semantics, but the observation that I want to make here is that uh, this is not wrong or broken. It just isn't the observed remote semantics that, uh, um, that uh, we want. So, for example, let's just take uh, uh, a single set with uh, element one in the LCA. You add one to the same set, right? and because one is already in the set, nothing changes. Right? Here's the problem. Right? So we don't capture the fact that the uh, add was included. And on the other branch, you could remove the element. And now, when you merge it, uh, you get empty set on both sides, right? But uh, 
but abstractly, if you if you just take the definition of advance uh, uh, set, there is an add, there is a remove. So add should win, right? So one should be in the result, but it is not. Um, so our, uh, our intersection between the three versions is an empty set. Um, this delta is an empty set, and this is the finding just the newly added elements, which is uh, nothing. So that's also an empty set. So our result is uh, empty set. But our implicit specification that we have in mind for admin set is different, right? It is giving us a different result. So, so that is the first observation that we make, right? So the thing is, this is not particularly broken. It just doesn't define what is even expected of uh, uh, this MRDT. So in our OOPS 2019 paper, we actually presented the semantics. It was one semantic, but it could be, there could be many, many implementations of set, right? And uh, this is certainly not over set. And the important observation that I want to make is that uh, convergence alone is not sufficient, right? So these uh, these these um, two versions converge to the same value, but uh, the intent, which is that the advents, is not preserved. So that's the observation that uh, uh, the first observation that we made actually in this work, right? So essentially, your counter may return merge function may always return zero. So if you just look at the convergence, then yes, always returning zero converges. But we don't capture the intent. So that is where we started, hey, intent is an only term, right? So how do we capture intent? We need to formulate the intent of operations, right, on uh, the data structure. And, uh, and what we realized is that we need a formal language for specifying the intent of an RDT that is rich enough to specify what we expect from a concurrent execution, right? That's the first thing. And, uh, <laughs> and because these implementations are quite complicated, the specification language um, and uh, relating that to the implementation, right? So there is usually a big ad gap uh, that I find in lots and lots of these works. And uh, at least I am not smart enough to take the proof on paper and say, hey, my implementation exactly matches, uh, matches what I expect here, right? I'm not a verification person. I just don't know how to do that. Well. So I said, hey, it would be nice if uh, we took advantage of uh, all of the mechanization work proof mechanization work that uh, is there. So the other uh, guarantee that I wanted when we started this work is uh, let's actually bridge the um, air gap between uh, um, the specification languages and the implementation so that I can take these uh, implementations, extract it from, extract OCaml from that implementation and directly run it on pop of permit. So that was uh, our goal from the get -go. So with that, we um, implemented this uh, idea called people, which is, uh, um, a library of certified MRDTs, and it's an F-star library um, implementing and proving MRDTs. It's freely available. You can go to that link and check it out. The specification language is actually inspired from uh, Burkhart, uh, Burkhart's work from Popo 2014 um, on replicated data type specification verification for automatically. Um, the idea there is, uh, um, their, their idea was you sort of think about these specifications as uh, the axiomatic models that we use for the, um, specifying the behaviors of uh, um, weak memory machines, right? So uh, weak memory models. So it's a, it's, a, it's a nice idea. So you can sort of uh, think about uh, distributed systems that uh, um, weaker notion of uh, um, models which are weaker than uh, weakest memory model that you have uh, um, in practice. It's actually a very cool idea. So we sort of, uh, it was, the work is very popular and we said, hey, why not? Um, and the idea particularly that we take from the paper is uh, what is known as application aware simulation. I'll cover some of these uh, details in the talk, uh, later, which connects the specification with the implementation. And importantly, what uh, we also provide you is composition. So you can take simple CRDTs, MRDTs, and then put them together. Um, you get a nice implementation, but also you also get to reuse uh, the proof of correctness of the smaller CRDTs for the bigger ones, right? You can actually construct applications um, that are correct by using the simple CRDT. And extracted CRDTs are compatible with Perman uh, because F star just gives you a nice uh, camel extraction mechanism. Um, so we can do that. I won't cover much of that in this uh, Okay, so. So what we saw in the earlier example, going back to the overset example is, uh, it was broken, right? How do we fix that? The fix is uh, sort of very standard, right? So you, uh, 
because you need to discriminate this uh, addition of uh, element um, especially when there is a element that is already in the set you associate each element with a unique id right um, so initially let's assume that the value is uh, a comma 1 where a is the element and 1 is the unique id when you add a again what you do is you get this uh, new unique id and then you add uh, the triple a comma 2 to the set and remove removes all the elements um, irrespective of their IDs, right? So you don't care about the IDs, you just remove all occurrences of A from the set. There's only one occurrence there, so that's removed, you get an empty set. Now when you merge, um, it does the right thing, right? So um, the intersection between these three is empty, so it's empty here. Um, there was one element added, A comma two, so A comma two is on uh, uh, the addition here, and no elements were added here. So it's empty and eventually you get a comma two. So this is this is what we want, right? So um, add, uh, add with set semantics is obtained, but observe that uh, unlike what um, I mentioned before, hey, let's just take secret priorities and extend, uh, um, add this merge function and magically we will get something useful. That's not true, right? You had to actually reason about uh, uh, what uh, you want and you had to modify these things. So this is, this is the trend that we see across uh, many, many different uh, data structures. But the thing that we want to do is this gets complicated, right? So we want to sort of uh, um, give you a formal specification um, and an implementation language and connect them together. So I'm going to be showing fewer pretty pictures and more uh, Greek, uh, but I'll walk you through the Greek uh, um, as uh, I go along. So we have this notion of an MRDT implementation, which we want to eventually connect to the specification. A data type MRDT is, uh, is a tuple, right? It has uh, it has a couple of things. It has the current state, right? Sigma is the state. It has a notion of an initial state, uh, sigma zero. It has a bunch of operations that you might want to do on this uh, uh, MRDT. So for a set, it might be add and remove. Uh, and we also have this three-way merge function. We always assume that uh, there is a three-way merge function for any data type. So this uh, three-way merge function is given by um, the programmer. And uh, Here's the implementation of uh, this um, OR set MRDT that includes this unique ID. And the way to read this is that um, we assume our elements and the IDs to be natural numbers, right? Our initial um, initial state is an empty set. And we have these do operations for uh, a bunch of these operations. So we have add and remove. We also have a read, which is the read operation on the set. Um, it takes the current state. Right, and each of these operations uh, also take this T. So the runtime system, the middleware provides this T. And what is this T? Um, this T is a unique Lampo timestamp. So Lampo timestamps, as you know, is uh, just to be a counter. Right? So if uh, two events um, happen before each other, then they Lampo. Uh, if A happens before B, then the timestamp of A is less than timestamp of B. So they are weaker than vector clocks. Uh, they are also more compact. Um, we assume they are also unique. You can add uniqueness by just adding the Netlica ID along with this, and this is fairly cheap to do. So we include this uh, timestamp here. Um, oftentimes we use this for uniqueness, but also for ordering. Um, here we just use it for a unique ID. So what does uh, let's let's just take add. What does add say? Add add says I'm going to add a, and it adds the tuple a comma t to the state. And every operation returns you a new state and the return value. Add doesn't return anything, so we just return bottom. Removes uh, an element A. Removes all the elements such that uh, they are, uh, the first element of the tuple right, is A. So you just filter them all out. And the rest of it is the new state that we return. And uh, the return value is actually empty because, uh, because we don't care about it all. And read simply um, gets the first component of the tuple, right? And then returns a set of all those. So if you do a read on uh, this set, you'll just get an A. And as I mentioned before, the merge is, uh, merge is simply um, the intersection of the three versions, the state of LCA, uh, A and B, and the um, difference delta between the two versions and the LCA, right? So that is the same as uh, what we had earlier. Any questions on this? Uh, 
I was going to ask a few, mm -hmm. one slide ago about your mm -hmm. unique fires. And now I see that you're, you're mentioning that these are the, the you're using um, Lampor time, timestamps. So what yeah. I'm wondering yeah. is that, so that means that, uh, I guess that we can go into this later, but that means that you're basically, you're baking in that this is a conversion causal consistency. What you call a strong eventual consistency is also like conversion causal consistency, but you are baking yeah. this in the pool, right? And yeah, the, yeah, we are we are baking it in the pool. Yes. Yeah. So my my question is whether we like this could perhaps extend to be parametric if uh, if you if you change the properties of the timestamps that we are using, are you going to be, get weaker or stronger specifications? So basically, I think if you have lower yeah, timestamps, really. you get like linear instability, right? I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, big, but... No, I, I think it's a good question. So the reason why we picked uh, um, the unique lampo timestamp is that uh, Herman is actually causally consistent, right? Oh. I'm already doing that because it is uh, it is causally consistent. You just have a branch, desert a permit, you get uh, the entire history, right? You can just walk backwards all the way up to the initial state, and that is precisely what we assume. When you do a merge, you just get the you just sort of uh, get both the histories and you can walk, right? And that's how Git is able to find the um, Git is able to find the LCA because it has the entire possibility. Okay. And that is why we assumed that the I mean it was it was sort of like already there for us and we just assumed it. But uh, the bigger question that you asked is whether we can um, strengthen or weaken this time step and whether we get uh, other guarantees. I really haven't thought about it. I think it's a really good question. Okay, maybe we can follow that. I, also, Imeric has uh, questions. I, he has, why do you need to pass the timestamp when doing read? Uh, it's, uh, well, yeah, okay. Actually, this uh, this T should not be the same T as this. Um, we just get the timestamp. It should be an underscore, right? So it's for all, for all A comma, whatever belongs to this set, the typo. Then. Okay, got it. Oh, uh, I think, I think so asking, what is exactly the intent of remove here? So remove is intending to um, remove all the elements that uh, are are this uh, a right. So so it's it's saying you may have multiple additions with different timestamps. But essentially, for the for the observer, just I'm removing a, so I'll just remove all the occurrences of a and any timestamp from this. Thing. Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm not reading the. Chat. Yeah. I, so uh, yeah, I maybe I don't know, Fedor, but well, uh, but did you said like you remove any or every instance of that? Every. 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 Okay. Yeah, so that makes sense. Uh, so I guess it's uh, you're removing A if you can observe that A is there at that point, right? Yes, that's right. So at that point, we have A, we are removing that A. Yeah. Okay, so let me let me continue. I think there'll be more questions uh, later. Uh, okay. So that's the that's the implementation, and then we have a specification, right? So what is the idea of the specification? We want to be able to sort of capture the um, notion of this execution in an abstract fashion without talking about the specifics of the implementation. And the idea here is that uh, uh, this is very very similar to what you would find with um, a relaxed memory model. So you have a set of events, you have uh, operations. These are functions. This gives the operation of the events, the return value, uh, the timestamp, and the visibility relation. We assume that the visibility relations are transitive as well. So that's the one difference. So for this concrete uh, execution, uh, the abstract uh, state might be, I, I had an initial add event, and then uh, I did another add, uh, which was visible to, um, I mean, which saw the old add event. Uh, I also did a remove, uh, which saw, the original ad, but not this ad, right? And this read is now being done. 
we just want to find out how to specify what this read uh, should be written right that's the whole point of the specification um and the specification for the zor set uh, is uh, provided here right so this uh, we we write hey i'm going to do a read operation here is the state of uh, the abstract uh, execution right um and the read says i'm going to return all a's such that um there exists an operation e which is an add and there does not exist an f which is a remove where the uh, um this add is visible to this remove so if you have an add which is not uh, shadowed by a remove then you will return that particular element right that's the that's the intuitive uh, uh, idea here so this particular add is shadowed by this remove so it's gone it should not be i mean that uh, that doesn't contribute anything but this particular add does not have uh, remove um which shadows it so that that value is going to be returned so if you apply uh, the specification of read on this abstract execution then you will get it right so this sort of tells you how to write uh, these specifications um and that is uh, that is our specification um language right so we sort of when we write in this formal fashion but essentially these are just uh, pure uh, um functional things that we encode in this stuff um so okay so now we want to connect uh, these uh, specifications to um the implementations and the way we do that is through this simulation relation a simulation relation essentially connects the, the abstract execution with the concrete state and uh, we sort of say how do you how do you get uh, the concrete state um, um what is the relationship between the abstract and concrete so for all ecmt the tuples ecmt that belong to um, the concrete state um I mean, this is if and only if there exists a operation add with uh, uh, time t, right? The same t here, and that does not exist to remove such that uh, e is visible to it. This is sort of exactly the same as what we had for read, but that is the intention, right? Sort of mirrors uh, the same thing. So it defines exactly given an abstract uh, execution how it relates to the concrete one, but also the vice versa. So this is this is part of the key. way by which we relate the abstract and the concrete uh, states and uh, we expect our uh, um, when you write an mrdt we we expect you to provide the specification and the simulation relation and how do we use the simulation relation for proofs um you have to do some additional work right um basically you have to prove the simulation first right so you have to show that the simulation relation holds so assuming that uh, um this uh, simulation relation holds between some abstract state and the concrete state and uh, you do some operation right uh, on the concrete state you get uh, sigma prime and uh, you apply the same operation on the abstract state essentially this just means that you take that operation you just add it to that soup the set of uh, events and associate all the visibility relation so this is done once and for all right so this is defined once and for all this is your operation definition Here is a simulation relation, and what you have to do first is to prove um, that uh, the simulation relation still holds between uh, the abstract, the new abstract state, and the new concrete state. So that's the first one. Then you also have to show that uh, um, similar simulation also holds for uh, the merge. So we proved it for the operation. We have the same thing for the merge. The idea here is that you have uh, the abstract uh, um, LCA A and B. and the concrete lca uh, a and b states which are related by the simulation relations right so we take that as the assumption you have your concrete merge definition right and the abstract merge definition is very simple right so you have these two abstract uh, states which are just sets and the relations so you just uh, union them together you get uh, you know what it means define once and for all right and you have to prove that the simulation relation holds between uh, um this abstract merge state and the concrete state concrete merge that you've written so this is the second proof that uh, um use that has to provide right and uh, and the third thing that you have to do is to actually show that um, um if uh, you apply a certain operation on an abstract state it returns some v then the concrete uh, state also returns the same v actually it's the uh, vice versa essentially if the simulation relation holds between abstract and the concrete state and you do this operation 
on this concrete state, you get a result A, right? And a new state, we just don't care about the new state now. Um, then if you apply the abstract operation on, uh, on the abstract state, you get the same value, right? So this is essentially saying my results are the same. Finally, we also have to, you also have to provide the convergence proofs. So this is quite interesting because uh, your same abstract state might have multiple concrete states. So I have sigma A and sigma B, which are two concrete states, which relate to the abstract state. And the proof asks you to show that uh, these concrete states are equivalent, um, which is convergence uh, modulo observable behavior. Essentially, the idea here is that uh, if you happen to have uh, two different concrete states, but if you apply these operations that are allowed on the data type and they're observationally equivalent, then they're essentially okay, even though this might uh, um, be two different uh, concrete states. Why is this important? It is important because it permits uh, um, two different replicas to converge to uh, two different concrete states, which may be structurally not equal, but observationally equal. So a good example is a binary search tree that we have. So we 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 just we, our merge function might not give you the same tree, but it gives you the tree with the same membership. Right? So this particular uh, property um, turns out to be quite useful. This is all a lot of work, right? I'm not claiming that this is easy. Uh, it is, uh, in fact, uh, I just work to prove this. But uh, but we are in F star, right? It, uh, it helps. Uh, it helps quite a bit. Uh, so actually, let's let's put this to work, right? So this easier one is easy. So we know how to do it. Um, that is uh, that has been studied well. We we know that works. Let's actually make this more efficient, right? This is where the fun begins. So observe that uh, in the earlier version, whenever you added elements, you get duplicates, right? This is not space efficient. So if you add an element hundred times and it's the same element, you just have hundred entries of the element, and the remove is also expensive because it has to walk. Uh, and remove all of the 100 elements, right? So that's, that's not really what uh, we want to do. How can we remove them? Here's an idea, right? Here's an idea. On addition, um, if you have the element already in the set, you just replace the timestamp with the new timestamp, right? That sort of indicates that uh, you're adding this new element. On merge, because you might have the same element added with two different timestamps, you just pick the larger timestamp. So this is my proposal. And it turns out that the correctness argument is tricky. It's not entirely clear why this should be correct, um, but it, it is in fact correct and we've proved it. Um, just to give you an idea of how this works, uh, the execution that we had earlier, where you add a day, um, where uh, we have two elements here. If you add a day here, you just have uh, replace the ID one with ID two, right? It's more compact. This is actually nicer. Um, and you would end up with the same state at the end. Of course, you have to write the simulation relation, and because of uh, the notion of uh, reasoning about uh, timestamps and greater timestamps and such, your simulation relation is uh, more intricate as one would expect. Right? Uh, it's a bit of work. I'm not claiming that this is easy, but uh, but if you sit and stand about this uh, uh, a little bit, uh, you would know that uh, this is just reasoning about timestamps and such. So. Um, here is, uh, here is uh, the set of all the uh, CRDTs that, uh, MRDTs that we've expected. So this OR set is um, the original one with the uh, duplicates, right? So that's 30 lines of code. This is all in F star, right? And this lines of proof includes uh, the refinements as well as uh, extra lemmas and uh, additional proof steps that we had to write. So F star gives us a nice balance, right? Which is that uh, um, if you are keen to um, spend some time trying to help F star. F star has an SMP solver underneath. F star is this uh, SMP solver aided programming language for uh, those who uh, don't know. It supports refinement types. It's quite powerful. It can also support uh, uh, ML style effects. We don't use FX in this. We just use the pure fragment. But the fact that an SMP solver is sitting underneath is uh, very helpful. So it gives us uh, a way to strike a balance between interactive proofs and um, um, and uh, and just just throwing the SMP solver at. So, for example, um, we could we could uh, prove the OR set um, with no additional lemmas, right? And it took four to three seconds. And if we spent a little bit of time writing lemmas which help uh, F star, then we can uh, bring that down to eight seconds, right? And uh, 
and of course smp solver uh, I mean, uh, it's a bit of a black magic to actually automate it so the more information that you give to the smp solver uh, the better it can uh, go so we are still learning here so for example this optimized or set that i just showed you right takes uh, much longer take uh, 1700 seconds for execution but the lines of proofs is not too bad right so it's 60 and uh, 108 lines of proofs it's less than 2x so we think this uh, approach is scalable we proved lots and lots of uh, these data structures. We have, uh, I won't have time to cover a lot of these. We also have um, um, very rich data structure, uh, which is a queue. We have the first implementation of uh, a verified uh, distributed replicated queue, um, which we proved. Um, so I, mean, I won't have time to go through it, but uh, it's there. It's on the paper, have a look. So the thing that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is uh, the original question of composition, right? Um, but I said composing CRDTs is hard. Don't take it from me. So take it from Martin Kleppman, who uh, wrote this very nice book, Designing Data and Depth Applications. You should uh, take a look if you haven't. Um, so he wrote this tweet. Right? So today in distributed systems uh, are hard. I wrote down a simple CRDT algorithm that I thought was obviously correct for a course that I'm teaching. Only 10 lines, right? And he found the fatal bug uh, after many hours of trying to prove this algorithm right. And the observation here was that um, uh, the, he was composing a last right and wins map uh, with the set, right? And individually, these last, last, last right and wins map and the set was fine. But when you put them together and you had this interaction between uh, delete and update, that is precisely when this problem occurred, right? So this is quite tricky. So I, I really think um, that um, um, that these algorithms really demand uh, mechanized uh, proofs, right? Because these things uh, these things end up uh, the complex they just uh, uh, explodes quite fast, even for very simple data types. So the thing that we actually do in this work, which I think is a uh, is um, is one of the primary contributions, is that. Uh, we sort of give you a way to build uh, composable CRDTs, right? Um, and what do I mean by that? So let's just take an example. So you want to build uh, an IRC style chat, right? Where uh, you have channels, um, you can send and receive uh, messages. You can read messages from channels, you can send messages. But for simplicity, we just assume that uh, these channels um, cannot be deleted and the messages that you send cannot be deleted, right? So if you think about it, uh, what do you need for this? Um, I can maintain the data structure for uh, this uh, chat application, a distributed chat application as a grow only map, right? Where uh, the keys are strings, the channel names, and the values are mergeable logs. So you just append the messages, and then when you want to merge, you use the timestamp to totally order the messages, right? That's the idea. We are not doing anything clever, right? You can, you can extend it uh, later. The goal that we want to do is to that. Um, I want to prove the correctness of the map separately, log separately, and then put them together, right? In particular, it's not just composing them together and then, uh, hey, you get this nice thing and you're done. We uh, essentially want to also have a proof that uh, the thing that we put together satisfies the specification of uh, the IRC style chat, right? With the operations that we have on the um, data, the application that we want to build. So that is where we want to be. And, uh, and we have been able to do that in this work. I'll just sort of give you the crux of how this uh, um, structuring looks like, right? We want, to, we want to take, we want to particularly take one CR MRDT that can have other MRDTs as values, right? That's the, that's the goal. So I'm going to provide the specification for the map MRDT, right? So, um, we call it the alpha map. Alpha is just uh, um, the polymorphic uh, argument that uh, we will have. In particular, we are assuming this alpha itself is uh, an MRDT. So this alpha map, um, the specification here gives you the specification of the get operation on the map. It is really written in this weird fashion. I'll explain what is going on. So this get operation, right? Typically, when you when you get an map, you just provide the key. But because we want to focus on composition of proofs as well, what we are doing is that uh, in addition to the get operation, which takes a key, we are also taking an operation 
on the underlying value type, right? So this map stores uh, alpha values, alpha values. So we are also taking an operation alpha and uh, we are describing what is the semantics of uh, this uh, uh, in the specification. So it is taking an abstract execution here. And what do we do first? We first, we have an abstract execution. It's like, a, it's like an execution graph, right? The first thing that we do is to actually project this graph the execution graph for the abstract map, this alpha map, filter it down to um, the underlying data type alpha, filtered on this key k, right? So this project function filters the abstract state of the map k, map on the key k, and returns an abstract uh, state of the underlying data type IR, right? And once you get this underlying data types abstract execution, we just call the underlying operation, right? All the specification of the underlying operation O of alpha on this uh, abstract state. So this uh, this project function we expect uh, the user to provide. Right? Just to give you an idea of how this looks, so we have set operations in the map, right? So you do you do set this uh, uh, set this particular key with this with this value, right? Instead of value, we actually provide the the operations here. I'll come back to how set is defined. So essentially, I'm sending a message uh, hello in general. I'm sending a message error in compiler. I'm sending a message uh, uh, world in general. Right? And when you do this get operation, you actually say which key, which channel you're reading from in general, and the operation that you want to do on the underlying data type. Right? This is the read on the underlying data type, which is the mergeable map. Right? This up and only mergeable map. So I'm doing a read on that. So because I'm filtering it down to general, so this will be hello and world. And uh, for, for reasons, uh, uh, we return the messages in reverse chronological order because it makes sense. We want to read the messages uh, earliest to latest. Right? Sorry, latest to earliest. Anyway, so that's the idea, right? And uh, this is the last thing that I will cover and then I'll uh, stop for questions. So here is the implementation, right? It does a lot of things. The things that I want you to focus on is that first, um, the state of the alpha map, right? The state of the alpha map actually has the state of some alpha, that's an MRDT, right? It's a string, but the value is an alpha. Um, the initial state is 20, that's fine. The get operation, right? Which is what we had done there is uh, get applies the given operation of the underlying data type, right? At value k. So it, uh, it sort of uh, fetches the underlying value, right? And applies this operation using this do alpha. It actually does the underlying operation and then returns to the result. It doesn't change the state, so it remains sigma and then returns the result. Set is essentially get plus uh, updating the map value, right? With the new state. We ignore the map value here. We just uh, um, update the map value here, right? So you can read this offline. This, this is just like uh, mapping on that. The important bit here, this is what I think is the coolest bit is that um, the three-way merge on the map actually appeals to the three-way merge of the underlying data. Type. So when you have an alpha map where you have three-way merge, you filter it out and then you apply the three-way merge on the underlying data type alpha, merge alpha. That is where much of the power comes in. And the simulation relation also, right? is uh, appealing to the simulation relation of the underlying data type. And we use this project function that we saw in the earlier uh, slide um, in order to connect these simulation relations. And once you do that, right, you're done. You proved map once. Now map knows exactly how the simulation relation works, how the merge function works. It just appeals to the underlying merge function. And the proof of correctness directly follows, actually. So once you have the map, once you have the mergeable log, you just put them together, you get a, a IRC style pad. Uh, we also have other applications in mind where uh, you can just take um, um, this map and then uh, have a counter and you get a shopping cart out of it. And the typical shopping cart that you would like with the proofs, right? That's where uh, the real power comes in. Actually, I'll stop here. Um, and the summary is that we have this very nice F-star library, right? Which is also composable. Um, you you can you can sort of program with this and these are not like one shot right you can put them together you can extract ermin data types and run it uh, i mean ocaml data types and run it on ermin so this is still an 
uh, in early stages, but uh, I have lots of, uh, um, I see a lot of potential for this work. Um, so I'll stop here. I think we should have a few minutes for questions. Questions? Oh, I was speaking to a mute mic. I was going to say thank you for like the presentation. It was really uh, interesting. And I have several questions off the top of my head, but I will start with one that Jan posted on the chat uh, a little bit earlier about before the last example when you were discussing uh, composing specs. And he was wondering, is it is it possible to is it possible to write a spec that makes no sense, but it is valid with respect to the implementation? Because it's because it is either trivially inconsistent or or, or uh, trivial. Yeah, if you can write a spec which is uh, which makes no sense, and uh, yeah, so this is. Um, I think this. I think we expect the simulation relation to go through, but we don't make uh, we don't make any other structural guarantees that prevents you from writing um, spec that doesn't make sense. Um, so Aymeric is, is asking, uh, in practice, how do you retrieve the LCA of two different distributed parties? Do the parties store a history of their state and not just the latest state? So uh, this is this is what Ermin does, right? This is essentially, it keeps the entire uh, history at home. Um, not only Ermin. Do, uh, yeah, Git as well, right? Um, yeah, but I was thinking like uh, several like the uh, culturally conversion distributed data stores. They end up having a, a, an underlying big map in which is a timestamp uh, into the yeah. diff of your key value store, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's a bit unfortunate uh, that we have to keep everything around. Uh, but uh, but in my there is a nice result where if you have a fixed number of replicas, you can garbage collect previous states because you know and the intuition is that. Once all of the replicas are converged to some state, you can throw everything uh, prior to that particular merge. Okay. Uh, so, Jan, Aymeric, do you have a follow through or, or can shoot my uh, list of questions? I think. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, I, I, I was the, f the first thing that uh, maybe going from the, the, the end towards the beginning while I'd say that mm -hmm. you mentioned that you had done the last uh, last writer wins register. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's this? I mean, but that one is not conversion, right? That's a causal, causal memory uh, version. So we have uh, uh, what so that you have defined of that. So we have the timestamp, right? And we assume that it is always unique. So ah okay 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 so it's oh, but that means that that from for a single replica is not consistent with your history with your local history. Why would why is that? Because let me check. I, I try, I'm trying to think of the implementations with vector clocks, and whenever you have like the L the LWW semantics. Eventually, you means that you have uh, that you have uh, that you preserve the PO because you can trash whatever happened before, but you're always going to have in your state the the last the last write. So if but maybe I'm thinking I, I should take a look at how you define the spec and how you define the model because I'm thinking of just uh, uh, key value store and vector blocks. But, uh, yeah, but, but if, uh, if, if, if if internally you have all the state, we do have all the state. Right. This is even yeah, if you yeah, have master 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 just have an entire history. Where where I was uh, okay. Do you uh, would you be able to project a local history and the local history like if you Okay, maybe I can't take it out of line because I was thinking that uh, like for me, like LW, like my understanding of the spec of LWW is causal memory, but not perhaps an essential conversion, but maybe different here. Um, so the, and that, that regular, the question I had at, at the beginning had to do with, uh, with the, the, the fact that, okay, you decided to go to causal conversions or like a strong eventual consistency depending on the literature. And that's baked in in your model. 
Um, and when I, when, when I was thinking of this, I was thinking uh, of uh, a work by uh, Constantin Enea and other people. And now I noticed that uh, he, you uh, mentioned some of his uh, work and they have um, a, a, a work on replication aware linearizability that it, it, is, uh, it, it focuses a little bit on that, on how what, whenever you have like the pro strong properties for your timestamps, if you need a strong property for your timestamps, you are going to be uh, going to be less weak, and you're going to be in something that it's uh, uh, a little bit stronger than causal consistency, but weaker than linearizability, and then you know people start inventing names on on the criteria. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that uh, that reminds me of uh, I, I did read the paper. I I don't have uh, it off the top of my head, but I think it's an interesting question, right? So what is it uh, that uh, we actually get from uh, weaker timestamps. We have a timestamp uh, axiom that just says, hey, here is what the timestamps give you. I'd be, I'd be curious whether the, we can relax this and uh, whether it re leads to some other models. Because this model is assuming you have the, there are two things here, right? There is the, there is the merge function, which actually needs the causal history, right? Without the causal history, you can't do merge. Just by relaxing timestamps, I don't think, um, you would you would get uh, um, you would get a better model, right? Because you're stuck with this merge function, which expects the, the LCA. Um, so so I I, I am uh, I'm not entirely sure how much we can relax this timestamp. Maybe we can make it stronger. Mm -hmm. it might give us uh, something better. So and this also this this I reckon that these actions also uh, in a way are specifying the 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 relations in between this timestamp model and the spec of the merge function and also the algebraic properties of the uh, of the operations with regard to the merge right that's right yeah okay so i reckon that my last like sort of abstract technical question would be like uh you you're you have done this for uh, state based uh, CRDDs because yeah. you are basically building around the merge functions, yeah. and yeah. so what? Uh, why have you not explored like the uh, operation based? Approach? A good question. I think uh, I think we um, really good question. I think it, it just comes from the fact that uh, the the model that we are targeting is uh, is urban, right? And it's a, it doesn't yeah. keep track of operations, um, and uh, and I think that is the reason why we haven't looked at anything else. It also makes it also makes some um, sense here because uh, the, the the view of the world that I have in mind is you have lots and lots of operations locally, right? And mm -hmm. at some point you will choose to merge. So the so the thing that the, the typical example that I have is hey, I'm going to edit my file. Um, collaborative editing, so I, I do a lot of edits, then you click save, right? That is the time when uh, your updates get published and you get uh, remote updates. So there might be local operations. I'm not, I don't want to reason about these local operations uh, like then and there, right? So that's that's sort of model that we're going for. Okay. Yeah, but playing on the devil's advocates a little bit, when you see it from the aspect of the abstract specification, the, the, when you advocate for doing the operation-based approach is that because you want to say the, the, the higher level spec doesn't need to know about merge because merge is something internal to the distributed system and yeah. the, the user wants a queue and the queues don't have merge. Yes. They have like a yes. pop-up. I agree. I agree. I think... Uh, um, we haven't explored that uh, aspect. Um, queues were quite complicated, even with the state-based one. Actually, the merge function itself is very simple, right? So the merge function happens to be just using longest common contiguous sub subsequence algorithm. It just falls out naturally, right? But the specification language is an event-based model, right? And and if you look at the the proof lines, right? It's thirty lines of uh, code and thousand lines of proof. You could optimize it by abstracting certain things out, but really the difficulty was that the implementation was uh, quite obvious and the specification was in the operation based mode and uh, much of the work was trying to tie this together. Uh, I think the state based one works well for the queue. I just don't know how to specify the queue semantics using the state based uh, version. 
Okay, given that you're on the slide, I have a, another question from Elmerie so uh, about the experience using FSTAR and uh, especially with, regarding the automation and the verification time where you see that you have something like an hour and 20 minutes for the queue. Yeah. And he asked, what are, what are the pain points and the, the, what other features that you wish that FSTAR would provide to, to help you with it? I think uh, I think uh, that's a really good question. I think uh, it was a learning experience for us. We weren't FSTAR experts. So the thing that FSTAR uh, is really bad at is uh, because of the SMT nature, right? So you throw a problem, you just uh, add one extra um, um, one extra refinement, and then it explodes, right? The running time just explodes. So you don't have a good sense of where the cliffs are, right? And I, I think it's a hard problem because there are so many heuristics flying around uh, um, it becomes harder. F star has, and when there are failures, F star said, just says, I don't, I don't, I can't prove this anymore, right? I timed out. You don't get any feedback. You have to sort of work backwards. Hey, let me split this into multiple chunks and let's see where we are going. Um, F star has uh, meta programming support. It has the notion of tactics, but it is not as mature as what you would find in Kong, right? If you are used to doing Kong proofs, you just uh, start with this and you're like, hey, where do we even start, right? So I think um, the proof state that uh, you will have uh, in FSTAR doing uh, tactics is uh, not very pleasant. So, but I would like to explore it. I think uh, these things could be made much simpler by adding, um, doing some of these uh, very explicitly. So there are facilities, but it's not a polished tool, right? It's improving a lot, um, but uh, but it's, it's not there yet. Uh, FSTAR is very good. So if you have like, Small proofs that should go through. You're doing non, I mean, nonlinear arithmetic or something, and these are these are nice, right? Uh, there are nice uh, um, solvers for that, and you can really try out it. I I I like that language. I think it's uh, it's very camelish, and it supports FX, and you can start uh, has support for um, concurrent separation logics and things like that. So I'm very keen to explore that for uh, multicore camel um, going forward. Okay, I have a follow up for, for that one. So I was wondering how you actually is. Uh, so how did you go into implementing the, simu the simulation in in F star if you were using steel or some of these others to model the, the replicas or we is don't, it uh, uh, no, This was uh, we don't we don't use um, steel right so, uh, because uh, because all of our uh, data types and uh, functions are purely functional. We don't use FX at all. In this. Hmm. Like using the pure fragment of uh, this, so we didn't uh, need additional. We built our own, right? That is what, uh, and it's not much. The actual uh, mechanization that was required for these simulation relations is fairly, fairly simple. But so basically, you are building a model of the distributed system in your types, in a way. So yeah. you are. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I yeah. work on. You did a lot of work into implementing your own distributed separation logic in the into the type, <laughs> something like that. And the extra credits for, for it. Uh, okay, I will see if somebody else has uh, uh, another questions because uh, we, I reckon people started to leave a little bit out of time and I, uh, it's really late for you guys. So, okay, so like my last question would be what's next on this? What's uh... So, yeah, so I think there are multiple things that I want to try. Um, on the rate type side, I really want to support um, recursive types. Um, essentially, think about JSON, right? JSON is like a recursive type where you have maps and maps and maps and things like that. We don't, our support for uh, specifying those things is, is not there yet. I think it will naturally fall out of uh, the um, specification that we have for uh, these uh, generic data types. I assume, I assume so, just like the global map. But I want to try that. The other thing that I want to try is uh, um, I want to see whether we can we can use the more structural properties about convert um, commutativity, associativity, and idempotence, and not require this uh, separate um, specification at all. Right? Is there a notion of uh, I mean, earlier attempts failed? But I want to go back to that and see. I don't want this, these two languages and simulation relation, all of the proofs that are associated with that. I want to see whether I can use more structural properties, right? Given that your merge function is commutative, associative, and item potent, can you just uh, tell me that uh, this works for arbitrary um, data type? Can you get, can you get a mergeable thing? 
defining commutativity for the three way merge is sorry associativity for three way merge itself is happens to be um, quite challenging because you have this additional thing right um, and when you merge you have you get this new lca and you have to sort of reason about uh, the new merge right so i think it gets complicated that i think that's a fruitful thing to uh, look forward to next okay uh well, indeed, I recall that with some of the problems that you're mentioning, like I've seen it working on on, on these kind of things, but also seen it on the concurrent on the concurrent uh, separation logic size, and like we uh, we uh, everybody starting to converge on this issue of uh, oh, how do we make sure that we can do like uh, combine specifications when you need to reason about orders and what are the, the and what are the sort of the algebraic structures that allow you to combine specs, whether it's the uh, properties of merge in CRDTs or is the, the properties of your whatever model that you're using for histories and for concurrency and the usability. So it's kind of very interesting how like uh, all of these communities, including like memory models things you have uh, mentioned, we are all converging into studying like all these uh, questions of how to relate all this. Uh, uh, all these all these uh, aspects and especially particularly all these things that we do on the system side with the actual specs yes. that we want to prove right and it's, yes i think it's, a, it's quite exciting i think it's quite exciting and i think what is um, what i think is getting exciting is this mechanization right with iris and with, um, with steel and whatnot i think it's a um, i really want to be in a world where uh, i can write these uh, Verified things very simply. I mean, I might be happy to put some work, but as long as they are composable and the proofs compose, right? I think it's a it's a nice uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice world to be in. Okay, I think that that's uh, I, we will leave it at that conclusion, and uh, I will uh, thank you, PC, uh, uh, Bimala, and others for joining us. It was kind of like a real pleasure for us to have this uh, preview, and um, of course and uh, so we will have another session on the caravan Sarai seminar in two weeks uh we'll keep you posted about the updates as usual uh, thank you guys for joining us and see you next time bye thank you thank you for having me bye bye thank you